Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. So today this event is all about getting people interested and getting people started in writing Android apps. Okay, um, we, so for those people who haven't met Android before, you're not going to be writing industrial applications by the end of the afternoon, uh, but hopefully you will have learnt all the tools that you need to start on your journey and you will have caught the bug. Uh, for those of you who have had a play before, hopefully you will have learnt something new um, and you'll have met other people also interested in it, so you can go away and learn together. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is um, the people you're going to be learning from today, um, one of them's here and we'll meet some of the other ones later, but most of them are sitting next to you and behind you and in front of you, okay? So we're going to uh, be learning from each other uh, whilst we go through the tutorial and everything with each other. So if any point during the afternoon you have a problem, uh, you don't know what's going on, then turn to the person beside you and say, can you help me? And they might be able to help you, they might turn to the person next to them and say, can you help me? And eventually they'll find somebody with the answer, hopefully. Okay, so that's the kind of atmosphere we want going on this afternoon, yeah? So it's not, we're, not, we're not teaching you, we're facilitating you learning. We're fa facilitating you having fun as well. That's the important thing. Yeah, cool. So, um, if we just introduce ourselves. Um, firstly, we've got Matt, our resident expert. Do you want to just say a few things about yourself? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I've been doing Android development for the past year uh, on placement. So I'm currently a third year student. Last year I spent down in Brighton. I was working for um, a small company, Rebo, and um, we did apps for like clients, so did Tesco and people like that. Um, also done some in, some of our own internal stuff on Android, and I got a pretty good idea of how it all works. So that's me. So that's where Matt's coming from. Um, Martin, also here. Do you want to say anything about what you've done in the past with Android? Well, this is my first year with Android, and I've created an app which covered the most basic concepts covered in Android, and I'm just keep going. So Martin's an example of, of a person who wanted to be able to do something, went away, learnt it, made mistakes and learnt from those mistakes. So hopefully today you'll be able to learn from his mistakes as well as your own. Um, the other three people on there are uh, me, uh, Daniel and Dragos who are sitting at the back. Uh, we're from Man Up, so if you haven't heard of Man Up, uh, quick plug, we're Manchester Ultimate Programming, we hold events like this and weekly talks where we try and have fun with computers. And if you want to know anything more, go to our website, our Facebook page and ask us questions. Um, quickly summary of what's going to happen today so everybody's on the same page. Uh, we're going to have a talk, which is why we're in this room, because this is a, a room for giving talks. Um, and it's going to last about half an hour. Uh, Matt's going to give you an overview of Android, how all the different bits fit together, some grounding so when we go and start running through the tutorial and start doing some more work, uh, we have a shared understanding. Um, when we move through to LF15, uh, we're going to split it into different groups depending on what people want out of the session. So we'll have a group for people who haven't done anything before walking through that door and we'll help you install what you need to install, uh, get things set up. Uh, we'll also have another group for people who want to start uh, running through the tutorials, going through. And we'll also have a third group for people who've had a play before and want to look at some more interesting topics, want to start uh, doing some development and that kind of thing. So, can I just have a quick show of hands? Um, who's, who's an expert in Android? So, nobody. Well, that's, that's good. Who's had a play before? So quite a few of you had a, had a play before. Well, that's good. So we're going to give you the opportunity to get together and play together. Um, who's managed to go through our installation instructions and install some things on their machine? A lot of you. Good. Who hasn't? Who's just walked through those doors and hasn't done anything? Uh, include yourself in that group if you've tried and failed the instruction sheet. Okay, one more, two more people. 
three more people, good. Okay, so it looks like we're going to have a nice mix of different things going on. Um, brilliant. So, so you might get to different stages in this depending on what you've done before getting here. If this is very successful, then we might meet again and give people an opportunity to build on this. Uh, this is kind of a toe in the water to see uh, what we can get out of this. And I hope everybody has fun. That's the most important thing. So I'm going to hand over to Matt now, uh, who's going to uh, talk about things that you're actually interested in hearing about. Okay, thank you very much. Cool. Just do this quickly. Okay, so what I'm going to talk today is mainly just a basic overview of Android. So it's not going to be too much about how you actually code stuff. It's going to be more just an overview of the, how the system fits together, all the different components, and just pointing out bits that you should, um, you should probably look more into in the next couple of hours. Um, so there'll be a little bit of code shown on the screen, but I'm not going to go through it too much because the documentation is actually pretty good for doing that. And in half an hour, I don't think we've got much time to actually do some code. So, okay, so let's quickly go through the basic structure of an Android app. So at the very top of it, you have the application. So each component has its own life cycle. So what that means is it all, you've got a Java class and it'll have methods that are called at specific times. So you normally have like on create, on pause, on resume and on destroy. So on create is when it first gets created. So the app, in the application's case is when you first launch it, you'll get that first I'm being created. So that's a perfect opportunity to start kicking off some of the stuff you need to do in the background, some of the bits you need to do for your app. Below that, you've got each activity. So who actually uses Android as their day-to-day -day phone? Cool. So each of the screens that you see, each of those is essentially a different activity. And for all intents and purposes, you can class it as a separate application, almost. So they each have their own life cycle. So when you first open a screen, it'll go on create. So it creates the, the view and starts setting out all the layout and stuff. And then it'll go through a series of other methods which set up the class and make sure it's ready to go. So you have multiple of these in each application and you sort of navigate between them. Below the activity, you have what are called fragments. So has anyone got an Android tablet? A few people? No, Tom has. Um, so the fragments are basically the different elements on the screen. So you've got, so I'll probably run through an example now quickly, seeing as not many people have seen it. Uh, Visualizer, left, cool. So, i use this, that on. Yeah, cool. So if I use the calendar as an example. So on this screen here, you've got one big fragment at the top, which is the bit that you interact with there. You've also got another bit of UI here and another bit there. So you can think of it as encapsulating a single bit of UI within one screen. So if I look at the same application, which is exactly the same code, running on my phone, Okay, so hopefully you can see that alright, but that is the, basically the top bit that you saw on the application. So you can encapsulate these bits of UI um, as a single class and then reuse them in different parts and different configurations depending on the device. Okay, and then below that you've got the views. So these are each of the individual elements on the screen. So Android's got quite a lot of built-in uh, elements, but the most obvious ones are things like text, bo uh, text views, image views, uh, edit text, which is like a text box, date pickers, all this sort of thing is all built in. So you can use them um, in your fragments. Okay, so another integral part is the manifest file. So this one, when you first create an application, you'll get a file that looks a bit like this. Can everyone see the screen okay? I don't need to take the lights down a bit. Cool, okay. So the, app, the manifest file is just an XML file which tells the operating system what is in the app. So this is the one that gets generated for you when you first create a basic app. So you can see um, it describes the version code and the version name, gives a package name, uh, the icon you want to use on the launcher, the name for the app, and then each of the individ individual activities will go there. 
So each of the individual screens, you've got to define them there. Um, I'll go more, a lot of that won't make sense until you start playing with it, but hopefully I'll go through bits of that now. So, activities. So these are really integral to Android. So each of them have their own life cycle, like I said. So you can treat them almost as a separate application. There shouldn't be very much shared state between them. So if you've got uh, like a data object, you shouldn't really pass the whole class between two activities because you'll end up with the operating system keeping hold of both screens at once, using more memory and causing your phone to be unresponsive. So I'll go through in a minute, but you've essentially got a message passing system instead. So activities, like I said, should normally contain fragments which handle the actual UI. The activities should just be the link between those fragments, depending on what sort of um, device they're on. You might find yourself, when you're building for phone and tablet, and even the bigger 10-inch tablets as well, you might have different paths that the user goes through to do the same task. So on the bigger devices, it might all be on one screen. On the smaller ones, like the phone, they might have to move between three different activities. And that's something you'll see when you start building with it. Um, you'll be able to see, that'll, yeah, that'll become more obvious. Okay, so I talked about the life cycle a bit. Is that clear enough? Can everyone read the little text? Okay, so this is for a single activity, so a single screen of the application. So first bit, the activity is launched, and you'll get, the, the method on create will be called. So that's your call to start setting things up, to start um, setting the layout up, and getting ready for the view to actually be shown. You'll then get on start, which isn't used too often. Normally you just leave that as it is. Um, but that's the one that's uh, called afterwards. On resume is called the first time it's set up, but also if the user goes away from activity and then comes back. So if they go away, they click on a link, go away for a minute or whatever, and then they come back. You'll get on resume. So on the opposite side of that, there's also on pause. So the on pause is if you've got something running in the background or you're holding on to um, a, like a, a database cursor, a database object, you can then close that when, they, when, they're, uh, when you get called on pause because the user's no longer looking at your activity. They've gone away, so you don't need to hang on to it. You can free that memory. And then when they come back in on the on resume, um, you can then reopen it. And it's a way of making the whole system more responsive by you being as smart with your resources as possible. So after that, you've got the on stop. So this is sort of going down. And then when the activity is completely destroyed and wiped from memory, you'll get on, de on destroy. One strange thing with this is when you rotate the device, so when you go from portrait to landscape, you'll actually go through this entire life cycle. So they're in portrait, you rotate, and at that point it goes on pause, on stop, on destroy, and so you've destroyed everything, and then it will recreate it completely from new. So it's a little quirk of Android that seems a bit stupid at first, but what it allows you to do is to have different layouts and different functionality for different orientations of the device. What you can do though is, um, I don't think it's on, no it's not on this diagram, but you can save some state in between, so like the position in a list, or actually save some of the data. So when they come back into the correct the orientation they want, the data's already there. You don't have to completely reload everything. So you can do stuff like that, but by default, it will essentially destroy the screen and recreate it. So move on from there. Okay, so again, this is from the very basic, um, when you first generate a, a um, Android project, you'll get a basic activity. So this is literally all it does. So if you've seen Java before, you've probably seen something that looks exactly like this. You've got your package name, you've got the um, import statements, and then you'll see the class that you've created extends activity. So that's a built-in Android class, specific to Android. And that has a lot of the basic functionality built in. Um, and then you're overriding the onCreate, and then you can see here, setting the content view. So at this, you're setting a specific layout to be the view that's going to be shown. 
I'll come more into layouts in a minute. Um, you see you also need to call the super. So that's calling the super class. Um, so it runs its bit of arm create as well. If you don't do that, you'll get a crash and you'll get a tiny little error in the uh, error log. And at first you'll be confused because it doesn't pop up anything obvious on the screen. But if you read back, you'll see that you've just missed that one line. It's amazing how often you do that. Okay, so the layouts. These are defined as XML files. So they basically, def they basically lay out everything on the screen. As part of that, you've got the layouts, which is a bit confusing, the um, like layout containers and the actual views themselves. The containers, there's quite a lot, but the ones you'll use the most are the linear layout, the frame layout, and relative layout. I'm not going to go too deeply into them. I think I'm going to show you the basics of them, but these are the ones that you'll see the most. So if I go through, I think I've got... Okay, so this is an example of a linear layout. So hopefully from the name you can guess what it does. So you've got a view up here, and then in this case you'll see the orientation horizontal, so it'll put them next to each other horizontally. You can also have that vertically and it'll lay stuff out vertically. It's a really simple one to use. So you literally have your linear layout, and then inside I've got these two fragments. So they're going to be laid out next to each other. Um, you'll also see you've, everything's prefixed with Android. This is sort of a quirk of XML, which is why I really hate XML, because it's quite verbose. But you generally have to do, you have to do that with everything. And you've got layout width and layout height. These are required for every single element you put in. If you don't do this, you won't get any errors at compile time, but when you try and show the, the layout, it will just crash. It will complain. So the options you've got for that are fill parent, um, wrap content, and putting a specific width in. Um, the fill parent does what it says. The wrap content will see what the content is and make it exactly the right size. Um, and then put in a specific width in will um, make it that width. A little bit of a quirk on here, the linear layout has got something called a weight. So basically you define a ratio that you want the views to have. So in this case, fragment 2 is 3 with a weight of 3, and fragment 1 is a weight of 1. So you'll get that nice proportion. And for that to work, you need to set the width to 0, which is really unintuitive, but that's the way it works. Okay, so the relative layout, this one is much more complicated and you see a lot of Android developers not using it. So it looks the same, like that, so you've got a relative layout, still got the uh, width and height, the orientation, I don't know why I've left that in there, that shouldn't be there. So in this case we've got three fragments. So the way the relative layout works, you, say, you put the views in and you say how they're, def how they're laid out relative to each other. So if you look at fragment one, which is that top one. You, say, you see the, on line uh, 9, uh, you've got a line parent left is true. So it's aligned to the left of the screen, and it's also aligned to the top of the screen. Fragment 2, the one below, that one is aligned to the top of the screen, but to the right of fragment 1. Fragment 3 is aligned to the right of fragment 1 and below fragment 2. So you can see it's quite a simple language. Those are the sort of things you're going to be say, saying. And you can do quite complicated things. To do this with a linear layout, you'd need lots of le nested layouts. And when you get to really complicated ones, it starts getting quite slow, because you sh in that case, there's only one uh, layer that it has to go down. So this is the actual, this is what it looks like when you run it. So you can see fragment one to the top left of the screen, fragment two to the top and to the right, and fragment three taking up that space there. So you can just define all these things, and not many, not a surprisingly few number of Android developers actually use this, but it's really good for getting efficient layouts. You don't have to do this nesting of linear layouts, which looks ugly in XML. Um, and this is just much easier, much quicker. One thing I'll say as well, I'll go back, there's another one, which I haven't put in, is the frame layout. So the way this works, you essentially, it takes up the whole screen and that any views you put in there are laid on top of each other. So the one at the top goes to the back, and then it goes forward. I think it's that way around. So the best, this is best to use when some of the views have got some, some sort of a transparent area. 
So if you've got an image and you want to overlay some text on it, you'd use a frame layout. And you do this just because it's a lot quicker. Android just knows that they all fill the space and it just puts them in. So it doesn't have to go through the process of measuring each one and putting it in. It can just slap them straight in. Cool. Okay. So I mentioned before about the moving between activities. So the way you generally do this is using intents. So intents are basically a small pointer to the next place you want to go. So generally you'll do it between, like with moving between activities. So I'm this activity, I want to go to this one. Um, in that case you'd have an explicit link. You'd do the, the uh, activity class name dot class. So it's a uh, Java reflection sort of thing. But you can also put in data URIs, you can do all sorts of fancy stuff with them. They're also used for passing messages, for system messages to activities. So the system is constantly sending stuff out like the Wi-Fi is connected, the Wi-Fi is disconnected, the screen is turned off, uh, the brightness level has been changed, all that sort of stuff you can register your interest in. So you can register that you want to be told about certain events happening and your app can respond to that sort of thing. But internally, you're going to be using it to move between different screens. So I put a quick example of that. So as well as that, you can be passing small bits of information. Generally, these are primitives. So things like strings, um, integers, doubles, floats, all that sort of stuff. And also this weird, if you, you'll have to look at the documentation for this, but there's this idea of a parcelable, which I can never say very well. So you can take a big complicated class, package it down and then send it through an intent and then at the other end it will reconstruct it into a full class. So it gets a bit hairy when you're doing stuff like that. But you can pass data through as extras. So in this example, you're creating a new intent, you're passing in a context which is basically Android's way of getting access to certain system stuff. Um, generally, oh, an, an activity is a context, so you can just pass your own, pass yourself in, which is a bit weird. You then say where you want to go to, so in this case we're going to another activity, and the dot class, the reflection bit, so you've got some extras you're passing through, and then you're just saying start activity and passing it the intent. And that's Andro the Android system's cue to start the process of changing screens. Okay, so fragments. Just some water. Okay. okay, so like I said before, these should be used to encapsulate certain bits of the UI. So generally, if you've got a tablet app, you might have a list on one side, and then the details on the other, on the opposite side. Um, you can also rearrange these depending on what sort of device you have. So you can have more fragments on a big, a big tablet and move between screens and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so I think I'll show you... Okay, so this is just one of those fragments I showed you before. Just a really simple um, example of that. Turn the lights down a bit. Ooh, a bit too much maybe. Okay, um, just a really simple example of that. So you're now extending fragment. Instead of, instead of extending an, an activity. Um, you've got to have this blank constructor, um, another weird quirk of the way it's um, designed. And then in this case, you've got different lifecycle um, methods. So you've got one that's on create view. So what this allow, this is basically your call to actually create the view. So you'll get passed in a layout inflator, which you then use to inflate the XML into actual classes. So you don't have to do that yourself, that's all handled for you. Um, you also passed in the container, so where you're going to live, and also um, any, um, any state. So if the, if the fragment's being reconstructed, then you might get some state, which is used for you to set certain things in a certain way. Um, so you see here, all I'm doing is having to return a view. So I'm inflating it, passing in one of the resources, which is this layout thing. So you can see R, layout fragment 1. That... Um, that points to a specific file in the layouts folder of your resources, um, which is one of those layouts I showed you a couple of slides ago. You're pa also passing in the container, just so it knows where it should be living, how big. So this is the actual 
um, fragment one layout file. So this one's a really simple one. So it's the one I showed you before. It's just a text view with background set, text color, um, text size and all that sort of stuff. And it's just this one here. So you see just how it relates. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk really quickly about views. Um, there are a lot of views on Android. So the ones you'll come across the most are text views, image views, buttons, list views. Pretty much every application will have one of them. Um, there's also grid views, progress bars, spinners, date pickers, galleries. There's, if you look at the documentation, you can see how many subclasses of view there are. And there's over 50. It's like 58, 59. Um, so there's lots of different built-in things. And when you get further into making your own Android app, you'll start realizing that the functionality is good, but not quite what you want. So you can start extending them. So because they're just standard Java classes, you can extend them, overwrite some methods, and change it to do what you want it to do. Um, and you'll find yourself doing that and mashing two different, so, uh, I don't know, mashing a button and a progress bar together or something like that to create your own bit of UI. Okay, I don't think I've got any examples. Okay, so the best way to learn them is just to have a look at the documentation. You'll be able to see each of the different um, methods you can pass in to make them do what you want. Okay, so I'm going to talk really quickly just about patterns. So, a lot of the time I focus on uh, doing the UI on Android. So, I'm quite interested in making sure everything conforms to the way Android expects apps to behave, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so quite a lot of you use Android. Who doesn't use Android as their phone? Okay, quite a few. So, I'll take, I'll do some examples. Okay, so, if we take a look here, uh, it's probably a bad thing, one sec. Take this away before I start lo showing you my emails. <coughs> okay, there's still quite a lot there. Maybe don't use that app. Okay, maps, that's a better one. Cool. Okay, so one of the main patterns of Android is the, um, the action bar. So this is the bit you see at the top of the screen. So, I'll zoom in a bit. Zoom, okay. So, at the top of this screen, you can see there's a lot of different controls that you'll, um, you can interact with. So, these might differ between different devices. So, the same app on um, the phone probably have, it won't have the big search, search maps option, but might have button for that. So, on the far left, of, so if you look at this bit, on the far left, you've got the um, app icon. This also doubles as an up arrow, which is very, very subtly different to, a, to the back button on the phone. Um, I'm not going to go through that because it's complicated and wordy, but if you look at the um, documentation, it'll explain the differences between the up and the back. There's different actions that they should perform. So number two on this list is the uh, a spinner. So you can choose, instead of using tabs, um, you can use what's called a spinner to navigate your app. So you can, you can see it with the um, uh, calendar. So the spinner there changes you between different, view, different um, views. So day, week, month and agenda. Um, you've also got these buttons. So these are commonly used functions. So in this case so in the case of the calendar, you've got going to um, today. So if you tap that, it'll take you straight to today. And also creating a new um, event. So that, again, you're trying to bubble up the most used actions for that particular screen. And you're putting them as buttons on the action bar. So they're really, really accessible. You've also got this overflow um, menu. So you can see that there. These are just sort of less commonly used um, functions of your application. But you still want that. Want relatively easy accessible. So you've got things like settings, you generally put there, all the Google ones have the send feedback. Um, anything that isn't something that the user is going to be using all the time, but you still want to have quite direct access to. OK. 
Okay, so that's the action bar. Another pattern which has come out quite recent, which has sort of become more used quite recently, is the um, swipeable uh, tabs. So the idea is um, you should be able to be on one bit of content and then swipe to the next bit. So you can see this very easily on here. You can just swipe to the next day. And that's a very common pattern you'll see on Android. So if I dare to go in to my email, yeah, I don't know what this is. Um, so you've got an email here. And you can, instead of going back to that list, you can then just swipe to the next one. So you also see it as navigation within an application. So if you've got tabs, you should be able to swipe between them instead of tapping on the tab. But you also see it um, swiping between bits of content when you started drilling down. So in this case, the uh, Gmail app. Okay. Okay, so there's lots of other patterns and lots of other bits of um, design related stuff. This website is well worth reading. So it's on the developer website and then the, the design tab at the top. Even if, you, even if you think you're just a developer, you should still read this because it gives you a lot of insight into why everything's designed in that, certain, in that way and how you can make your app conform to these standards. And it's well worth doing because if you release your app onto the store, if they don't conform to standards, they won't tend to promote them as a featured app. Um, if you talk to the guys at Google, they'll just, they basically just suggest that you conform to this before they'll start featuring you. Okay, I think I'm coming near to the end. Okay, services. So this is something that's going to be, ha this more like the back end of the app. So if you've got, as I said before, the activity shouldn't share too much state between them. But obviously within an application you should, you still need some sort of either data store or um, some state st shared in the background. The way you do this is using a service. So you can create this in the application um, class. So when you first create the application it'll start up the service and then each activity can bind to it which gives it access to the um, methods uh, in the service. Um, the most common, one common way, way that they're used is in things like music apps. So the, the actual music playing will be done not in the activity but in a service. So that has its own life cycle, like every component on Android. And when you move away from the app, it's still kept running. Um, by default, it runs on the same thread. So you need to do, um, you need to either tell Android in the manifest file you want it on a separate thread or using something internally called async tasks. If you don't, everything will be running on the UI thread, which, when you're scrolling through lists and stuff, is not very good. You want as little as possible running there. So the way you interact with it, I'm not going to show you code examples, there's plenty on the developer website, is through binding to them. So this gets you a reference to the um, service. Make sure the, ser the service knows that you're interacting. So it, does, it doesn't try and kill itself midway through. <coughs> and then you can interact with it by calling its methods. The other way is using the intents. So you've got, um, you've got an object in Android that's just a service, or you've got an intent service, which is, again, another built-in class, but gives you, it's already written some of the functionality you need to be able to interact with, with intents. So you can pass messages, and it will resend, send a broadcast back to you and anyone else who's listening. So you can ask it, um, I don't know, how many, how many items are in this data store, and it'll send a broadcast back with that information. And I think we've come to the end. Okay, so it's time to go play. First, I was going to point out some useful links. So the Android developer documentation, really, really useful one. So, one thing I find myself using a lot is the reference, because it's hard to remember lots of classes. So you can search up here for different things. And you'll get a list of all of the different things you can do with a, te a text view. You can also, if you use Chrome, go into the Chrome Store, and you can download an Android developer widget, that allow sorry, widget, um, application, that allows you to type AD in the title bar, then press space, and then you can just type exactly what you want. 
and it'll take you there. So that's one really useful thing to install straight away because you'll be able to search through the documentation a lot easier. As well, take a look at the design one. It's really, um, really well written and there's lots of information there to read. I think that's it. Yes,